I'd like to welcome you to our first David S. Sauerman Provocative Lecture Series for the fall of 2009. Um, for those of you who have not been here before, uh, this lecture series started in the fall of 2001 to foster our vision of higher education. We uh, uh, would like to challenge ideas and develop critical thinking in an environment of respect for intellectual discourse. Um, you, our guests, are invited to relax, and this is uh, Lydia's words, um, relax, ponder, and enjoy our guest speakers as they develop their positions on controversial issues. Uh, we provide a question and answer period at the end of the presentation to allow the audience to engage in a respectful dialogue with our speaker. And it's our hope that these lectures will allow a more thorough understanding of topics presented and a greater appreciation of the diversity of opinions. We are fortunate um, this afternoon to have with us Professor Ellie Berman from uh, the University of California in San Diego. He'll be speaking about his new book, which is available out front. This is actually the first time he's seen the book, since it just came from the binders. We were able to get copies of it. It's called Radical, Religious, and Violent, The New Economics of Terrorism. Professor uh, Berman is an associate professor of economics at UC San Diego and research director for uh, international security studies with the Institute of Global Conflict and Cooperation. He's also a research associate with the National Bureau of Economic Research. His research interests include economic development conflict, economics of religion, labor economics, technological change, economic demography, and applied econometrics. Okay, Things that I'm sure all of you are interested in. Um, recent grants from the National Science Foundation have enabled him to look closely at the relationships between religion and fertility from an economic standpoint, and his latest publications are Religion, Terrorism, and Public Goods, Testing the Club Model, uh, with David Layton in the Journal of Public Economics, 2008, and the Economics of Religion in the New Belgrave, I'm uh, sorry, Paul Grave Encyclopedia of Economics uh, with Lawrence, oh, Jan sorry, Coney. Jan Coney. Oh. Uh, he received his PhD in economics from Harvard uh, University. Please join me in welcoming Professor Berman. I think so. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Does this? Um, that works. Yeah. Can you hear me back there? Oh, yeah. Raise your hands if you can't hear me. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. It's a, thanks. It's, it's a pleasure to be here to be the first provocative lecturer of the year. I don't plan to take my shirt off or anything like that. That's not <laughs> the kind of provocative lecture that they signed me up for. But my wife's a little worried. <laughs> Um, it's not hard to be provocative on um, when talking about terrorism, insurgency, and religion. And my goal here is to provoke you as much as possible. What I mean by provoke is provoke you to ask questions and have a dialogue about this, about about the topics. And um, the other thing I should note before uh, before starting out is that actually, as a labor economist, I have slightly mixed feelings about working today, since. Um, the, fac the faculty of the University of California um, have a choice about whether or not to, to be on strike today, basically, in protest of state budget cuts, which I know are a concern for all of you, just as they are for us over in the other system. And so, but since I promised to come a number of times and had broken that promise a number of times, I didn't think it was there was it wasn't it was it was it was a matter of where you're doing the least harm. And so I'm happy to be here. <laughs> In some sense, strike breaking, but maybe after hours. <laughs> okay, so um, here's what I want to talk about. This is the aftermath of a suicide attack. Um, this particular, so this could be in Iraq or in Afghanistan or in Israel or in Palestine. It isn't, it's in Algeria. Um, take a look at the target. The target was the Prime Minister's office. Typical of, a typical of a suicide attack, the target was well defended. There was that big fence in front of it that you can see. Oh, I can, I can do Whoops. Can you get the mic turned up a little bit? You might want to hold it next to your mouth. It might be easier to hear. How's that? No, closer. 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 <laughs> How's that? How about I just yell? 
How about this one? <laughs> this is. That sounds better. Try one more time. How about now? Excellent. I didn't really want to yell for the full hour. I'm good to yell for 10 minutes. But. Okay. This Prime Minister's office in Algeria, hard target. There's a fence in front of the building. The suicide attacker didn't manage to kill the Prime Minister or anyone on his staff, but did kill a large number of civilians and injure a large number of civilians who were on the street. The, the buildings on the street and the people on the street were, of course, not as well defended as the Prime Minister's office. As a political statement, though, he did blow the side off of a Prime Minister's office, which, 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 which is quite an accomplishment if you're, if you're trying to kind of make a mark for yourself. And so what, you want, what I want you to notice about the suicide attack is that as a tactic of insurgency or of terrorism, it's really quite an, effect, quite an effective one. And one person with a small amount of munitions and, and a van and can do an awful lot of damage. And in this case, can kill 12 people. The, okay, so how do we think about all this like economists? Well, there are basically three approaches. If you run through the literature on how we deal with terrorism and insurgency, there's what I want to talk about tonight is kind of a new approach, which is called the club model. And what most of the military are trying to do today in Iraq and Afghanistan is what we would call the old way, which is the, the hearts and minds model. And I'll talk a little about that. And then there's something else which is the really, the really old way, which is the approach that we were using, or the United States was using, to understand most of the allies were using up to four or five years ago, which was just targeting. So let me start at the bottom and move up, and we'll just move forward historically. The targeting approach basically says, um, we're going to treat this enemy like we treat the Soviet Union. We have awesome ability to deliver, uh, to deliver munitions to a target. They just say to blow stuff up. If you give me the geolocator, sometimes the license plate number, I can blow it up. And there's an amazing fleet circling the ocean, guided by satellites, which can deliver missiles um, from aircraft or even from, from, from ships, sometimes from land. And if you give them the geolocator, they'll blow it up. So, um, and up till the end of the Cold War, um, this is what military, military confrontation was about. It was about targeting, right? Had very little to do with behavioral science or social science. It was just about finding what the target was and, and, and destroying it. That's it. Yeah, is that a question? Yeah. Go for it. About your microphone? Did yeah. you, um, like, every time you turn to the left, I think it, it goes on, but then, like, when you turn to the right, it stops. Yeah, turn to the right. Yeah, you turn to the right. You need to turn your shoulders. Now, is it on the left and on the right? Yeah. It's okay now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So I just have to do this. It's like skiing. Okay. Back to our main event. <laughs> okay. The old, old approach is about targeting. And the US military has decided this isn't the way to go anymore. And I just want to draw a lot of quote on this. Irregular warfare is about people, not platforms. This is a sign of change within the bureaucracy of the US military. The thing that IW stands for regular warfare. IW depends not just on our military prowess, but also on our understanding of such social dynamics as tribal politics, social networks, religious influences, and cultural wars. People, not platforms, and, and advanced technologies will be the key to IW success. This was all codified in a, a new document in 2007. It happened around the same time as General Petraeus in, rewrote the counterinsurgency <coughs> manual. Um, and switched and brought social science back into the way that wars are fought in the United States. From the point of view of social scientists, this is actually a historic moment because it means that not only can we aspire, but as a, not only can economists aspire to um, redesign the healthcare system, redesign the social security system, the tax system, the monetary policy, we already own those. Now we can move into the economics of defense. 
And so it's really a great moment for us in fact. Yeah? But can aside, this is a big deal because the US military has now decided that it wants to treat populations not as enemies and friends, but as people that have to be dealt with in a, in, in, in a way that does not necessarily involve targeting or not targeting. Okay, if you're targeting or now, so switching now to the old way of thinking about insurgency. And this is how 99% of counterinsurgency courses are taught up to this day. And you look at what the British did in Malaya, which is probably the most famous of successful counterinsurgency operations. This was in the 1950s. And what you find, or what, um, or the, the relatively successful recent campaign in Iraq, and the guiding theory goes something like this. There are three groups. There's a government and its allies. This could be the American troops or it could be the Iraqi government. There are insurgents who are trying to control territory or control the government. And then there's a community. And unlike most war yeah, theories of war in which there's just these two folks and they shoot at each other, there's a community involved in this one. And the community plays a very important role. The reason for that, and this is subtle but important, the reason is that the insurgents generally can't operate without the tacit approval of the community. Why? Well, think about what the insurgents do. You get up in the middle of the night and you set an IED, a roadside bomb, by the side of the road. You have to dig a hole, you have to rustle around a little bit. Once you've done that thing, once, the, once it's set, when the patrol comes through in the morning, and you can detonate that thing and you can, you can blow up the patrol. It's a, very, it's a very effective attack. But when you rustled around in the middle of the night in a populated area, you, you made noise. And the community, the people that live on that street, hear the noise, and then they have a choice to make. Do they want to allow the IED to be set on their street? Or do they want to report you to the government stop, and stop the patrol from being blown up in the morning? And so the hearts and minds in this comes from an effort to win over the community to share information with the government rather than keep it to favor the insurgents. Right? That's hearts and minds theory in a nutshell. It's a little more complicated than that, but not a lot more. If you want to read you know, all that laid out in, in proper game theoretic form formally, then uh, there's a paper on my website that you can take a look at with Jake Shapiro of Princeton and, and Joe Felter of the um, he was in the US military academy, he's an active, he's a special forces director. And we've actually, we have some research on, uh, here's another theme that I want to kind of pick up on for this evening, or for this afternoon. And that's not just a proposition or a conjecture that's kind of thrown out there, it has testable implications, and those are tested in the same paper that I'm talking about, which you can pull off the website. And what we do is we look at Iraqi, at data from Iraq, on you know, what, the, what the government is doing for the community and whether or not you know, violence is controlled in that community. And what you, what you see fairly clearly in the data, which is consistent with the theory, is that the more money, the, the more the government spends money on uh, good governance, building schools, paving roads, you know, community development activity, hiring teachers, all the things that you would think a good municipal government would do, the more money they spend on that, the less violence occurs in that community. Right? Now, we, we could debate the appearance of that, and that's not what I want to do tonight. I just want to mention in passing that there is a way of thinking about this, which is pretty convincing. This is a strategy that, that, that General Petraeus and the, and the Allies switched to in Iraq, and it seems to be, have been relatively successful. Not a total success by any means, and the war in Iraq is not over or what. And, but much more successful than the previous approach, which was basically just doing this, targeting. Now, and this is a nice approach, and is a, this, is, this is a nice approach in the sense that it's consistent with the data as we know it, but it doesn't address a whole bunch of other issues that seem to be special about modern terrorism and modern insurgency, and that's what I want to tell you about tonight, for today. This is this club approach. Now, in this one, we're focusing not on insurgency and roadside bombs, but on terrorism and suicide attacks. And what's going to be special here about the suicide attacks is that 
This is a tactic which you can actually carry out without sharing information with non combatants Let me say that again. If you put a suicide attacker in a bus and he's, got, he's wearing the belt, you can actually do, or if you load a van full of explosives and drive into the front of the building and detonate it, like Timothy McVeigh, or like your typical suicide attack you know, for now, which now happens in Iraq or in Afghanistan, you can do that without sharing information with, with community members because you didn't have to rustle around in the middle of the night on the street. That takes the community out of the game, but it puts in another actor, which is a defect, possibly defectors within the organization. And so unlike this approach, understanding things, this approach, what we call the club model, is all about keeping members of the organization in consent to battle, entitled which is just a fancy way of saying keeping them behaving the way the organization wants them to be. Right? And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Today. Exactly. Since I'm here. I got heard it, San Diego. Okay? Questions about where we're going? All right. So now what I'm going to do is I want to do this like a scientist. We're going to, I'm going to give you some background. We're going to state some conjectures. We're going to see how the evidence applies to the conjectures. They're going to be refutable propositions. We're going to expose them to data. The ones that, that get refuted will dump, and the ones that don't get refuted will survive, and that's how we're going to move forward. In the tradition of you know, Galileo Galilei dropping objects off the leaning tower of Pisa and seeing whether Aristotle was right or not about you know, things 10 times heavier falling 10 times faster. They could have been bowling balls, right? Could have been bowling balls. Okay. So here are some interesting facts about modern terrorism. And here's a way in which it's very different from insurgency. Insurgencies, um, we have, we've had a lot of insurgencies. We know a lot about insurgencies. Um, civil wars, sub-state wars, um, have caused three or four times as many casualties as wars between the states, between states, since the end of the Second World War. Right? So if you die in a conflict in the last 50 years, it's much more likely that you die in an internal conflict, in a civil war, or in an insurgency, than in a conflict between countries. This is a very important issue for those of you from the military that sit here, because um, our military is mostly focused on the big conflicts, the ones between countries, and yet the conflicts that, we, that, that have been arising, in which the United States has gotten itself involved in, are increasingly um, substandard. Now, an interesting thing about insurgencies is, that insurgents tend to attack people of the same religion. That's what happens 84% of the time. On the other hand, terrorists tend to attack people of other religions. That happens 87% of the time. So it sounds like there's something special about religion here. We better understand religion. OK, so here's my point. Is that a question? You just, OK. I can see your hand moving because it's holding an iPod. <laughs> um, so here's what I want to do. I want to first take kind of the standard conjectures that people tend to throw out, the stuff you hear on Fox News or on CNN, and just kind of clear the underbrush by refuting conjectures that people think are true which are. That will bring us to some more interesting conjectures about what terrorist organizations are and what makes them leave. So first, I'm going to do this. We're going to talk about what motivates terrorists as individuals. And then I'm going to refute some stuff that probably, probably something you believe, which I believe before I go into this. And then we're going to move on to studying not individuals but organizations. We're going to talk about why radical religious organizations are the most lethal among terrorists and among insurgents, actually. We're going to talk about how terrorists differ from insurgents. We're going to talk about this defection constraint, this issue about how it is that if successful terrorist organizations manage to keep their rank and file incentive capital doing what they're supposed to be doing, as opposed to selling them out to the government. And then we'll talk about when suicide attacks are used, when it's time, time allowing. And then I, I, what I really want to focus on here is what all this means for counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, because this, it's, say, it's not just kind of the imperialism of economists that we want to take control of national defense policy. And there really are policy implications to this research, and I want to make sure that those are clear, and that will be clear. 
right? So, is anyone here because they get credit? You can be honest. <laughs> That's okay, I'm not in trouble. And are you going to be tested afterwards? Is anybody going to be tested afterwards? Okay. Even if you're not going to be tested, if you think you might fall asleep halfway through and then wake up, if you just keep track of these eight points, it, it'll make everything easier. So if you want to take a moment now and just write them down, that's a good idea. All right? <laughs> Even if you're not going to be tested, which I know you are. I'm going to ask you who thinks about point four, but this is my prerogative. It's a prerogative question. You what I want. Okay? Okay, so questions? All right. Oh, too quick. <laughs> <laughs> you done yet? <laughs> I'm going to talk for a while and I'm going to come back. All right? We're on number one. What motivates terrorists? So I call this the afterlife of other myths. Most people ask, what's the. Uh, What's the problem with terrorism today? Why is it so different from terrorism 15, 20 years ago? And they say religion. They say there is a new army out there of people who are, who, are, who, are, who are brainwashed by their religion. And that's what makes them you know, devoted assailants who are running around trying to kill us. And um, whoops. This is called the, the ideology of hate conjecture. A related proposition, a related conjecture, is that the reason that, that terrorists do the things they do is that they're promised such fantastic rewards in the afterlife that it, it makes it all worthwhile. Okay? So, you know, people don't usually think. People don't usually think about it this way. They, they hear that on CNN, they cut to the soap commercial, and they you know, stop thinking. But if you just stop with that for a moment and thought about it, think about it like a scientist. Is that, are those repeatable propositions? Well, you might think, well, it's hard to figure out what the suicide attacker was thinking if he's not around anymore to tell you about it. Right? Ah, but there are failed suicide attackers. The often the equipment fails, which is a wonderful thing. <laughs> and those folks end up in jail. And they can be injured. No, so there's, there's, a, there's a disturbingly growing sample of failed suicide attackers in, incarcerated in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Israel. In Iraq and Afghanistan, you never get access to them. But in Israel, the Israelis have a very open society about these things. And they actually get interviewed. They often sometimes get interviewed on television. And so there's a psychiatrist, actually a psychologist, Ariel Marari, who took this very seriously and went and interviewed suicide attackers, failed suicide attackers, and asked them why they did what they did. <coughs> It's a fascinating question. And here's what he finds. He finds that even among the suicide attackers who come from religious radical organizations, the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, if you ask them open-ended question, why did they do it, they absolutely never, zero percent of the time, say that their, that their motivation was religious. Nobody says, the Almighty appeared to me in a dream or whispered in my ear or anything like that. Nor do they ever say, I was doing it because I was promised these virgins in heaven. Which, you got to think about it. You're a news pastor. That's such a, it's a storyline that you can't resist, right? But if you're a scientist, it's a storyline that's absolutely false. And it's refutable. These guys never, and these guys don't buy into it, right? If you ask them why they did that's not what they say. What do they say? Uh, they, well, first of all, we should know that, and, that, we should have known that already, because there were terrorists and suicide attackers before Islam, Islamist yeah, terrorism came along, who were secular. In fact, most suicide attackers in the 1980s were secular nationalists. Were the secular, they, it was the Tamil Tigers, and they were neo-Marxists, right? They weren't planning on an afterlife. They had to be promised. And so, and, and yet, they did it anyway. So had we just looked back 10, 15 years from the data, we would have known this could that this didn't look like it could be true. So what are their um, motivations? Well, what Marari finds, which is a little strange, but not very satisfying, is that there's no single primary motivation that comes up repeatedly. But 
most of the things that are on people's lists are just not true. They don't come from poor families. They're not any poorer than any of us. So they're not economically deprived. They're not depressed or suicidal or mentally ill. They typically did not just break up with their girlfriend or anything like that. Right? So the normal reasons for the, the usual reasons for suicide in this age category just don't apply. There is a theory of altruistic suicide, and that's probably the one that fits the best. And this goes all the way back to, to Max Weber in studying, studying people with suicide, which is a fairly courageous form of research as well, when you think about it. Best we can think, these folks are altruists. And it seems that when you ask them questions in different ways, the answer you tend to get fairly consistently is, consistently is that these folks feel that they're carrying out some courageous act which will benefit their community. That's not the storyline that you usually get from the media movies, but that's the one that comes up in actual, in actual research. So now, let's just think about that for a moment. And remember, economics is about getting inside the head of the decision maker and trying to figure out why they do what they do. Okay? These folks think of themselves the way the firemen on September 11th who ran up the stairs and they fired themselves. They think of themselves the way the pilots in the Battle of Britain think of themselves. They're doing something courageous, not for themselves, but for the community. That kind of altruism we know is very, very common in economic life and in life in general. And it shows up here as well. Now, most people are very uncomfortable with the idea of suicide attackers as altruists, or terrorists as altruists. And for good reason. See, if you think about it for a moment, how, if you try to count how many altruists are potentially out there who feel strongly enough about some cause that they're willing to give their life for, especially if we're thinking about males about your age. <laughs> so as a labor economist, let me tell you, I'm willing to make a bold objection. You find some combination of attributes, tree-hugging fascist whose favorite band is Coldplay, right? <laughs> so, give me 24 hours on the internet, I'll find it. Right? There's just a lot of originality out there. Give me a month, I'll find someone who feels so strongly about whatever the thing is, the tree hugging, that they're willing to commit their life to it. It's not that hard. And so, the, and that's a frightening idea because what it suggests is that the pool of potential suicide attackers is very, very large. People who are angry enough about something to be willing to give their life for a cause. And by now, combine that with the fact that suicide attacks are not technically very difficult. It's very easy to kill a lot of people using this method. That should really scare you, right? This is consistent with what the Islamic terrorist organizations tell us. They say, we don't have to actively recruit. They come to us. And as far as we know, that's the truth. Right? And so what that says is that if suicidal behavior for a cause is not the binding constraint, those folks, there's a big supply of them. And that's why it means that there's a really big pool of people out there who could do a lot of damage. Right? For some cause. Huh. So, everybody frightened yet? All right. <laughs> Here's something we assure them. Suicide attack is almost never act alone. It's almost never the case that somebody goes to the Home Depot, buys the necessary fertilizer, gets on the web, figures out how to detonate the thing, straps a vest around themselves, or packs a van full of explosives, and goes in and does terrible damage. That almost never happens. In fact, the exception is Tim Hidden Bay, who either by himself or with a couple of other conspirators at most carried out the, the Oklahoma City the Oklahoma City law. The rule is that suicide attackers you know, are members of organizations who have clear goals and who are doing or carrying out the attack in order to achieve some ends. And in fact, if you look at the list, what you find is that only looks only a very small number of groups in the world are capable of carrying out suicide attacks one after the other and, and basically staying in business and of sustaining the, a, a wave of suicide attacks. So I've shifted the focus now from the individual to the organization. And now what you should be asking yourself is, why are there so few, right? I just argued that there's this huge pool of potential suicide attackers. There are lots of angry people in the world. 
millions, maybe billions. Right? Why are there so few organizations? How few? Well, the State Department has a list of 42. 42 organizations that, at least under the Bush administration, if you found someone who was a member of that organization, you could basically take them off and disappear them somewhere. Maybe more money. And, and, and without habeas corpus or due process or anything like that. You can freeze the assets of the organization as well, and that's different. And why only four, and of the 42, the top five or six on the list do over 80% of the debt. So if it's so easy, why are there so few organizations that can do it? It's not for lack of recruits. So why is it? Well, the answer I'm going to give you is, it has to do with that defection constraint, with incentive compatibility of members. And I'll let me make that argument but it's going to take me a moment to move along. So, back at that argument for a moment, and let me switch to, to some facts. So this is also worth knowing as background. Here are the, the five most lethal um, terrorist organizations around. We would now draw Muqtada al-Sadr's militia off the list, um, because they're not as active now anymore, they've kind of shifted themselves to be more like a standard militia and a political organization. And next on the list, interestingly enough, would have been the Tamil Tigers, who have now probably been yeah, utterly squashed. Though not by the means, not by the policy, not by the means that I would suggest, I'm going to suggest at the end of this talk, by kind of old fashioned and stubbornness repression. What's interesting about these organizations is how successful they are on their own terms. So let me just show you what I mean. The Hamas, um, within a year of organizing themselves, become the most lethal organization in the Israel-Palestine conflict. They're much more effective at terrorism than the secular nationalists in the front time, or, the, or the, uh, the other organizations who would be doing the same things, including the Islamic Jihad. And, and af afterwards, you know, revert to or become a very successful political organization as well. The Taliban. The Taliban, in some sense, are the most amazing insurgents slash terrorists of our lifetimes. These folks, and take a look, these are the, the, no uniforms, very little training. These are the, the kind of, the training these guys got, these are kind of the, the the failed graduate students of the Madrasa from the Afghan refugee camps on the Pakistani side of the border. These are folks who come from almost the worst backgrounds you can imagine. Grew up in refugee camps. And no particular training, and maybe high on motivation, very poor equipment, and not veterans of the Afghan civil war. So, they, and what do they do? They push the warlords and, uh, and they push the warlords out of Afghanistan, something the Soviets barely managed to do and Allied forces are not managing to do today. And they conquer and hold the entire country, something that General McChrystal would love to do in his dreams, but isn't anywhere near accomplishing. This bunch of folks, with the combined resources of what? Of almost nobody. Right? They got some, some ammunition, a little bit of training, and some vehicles from the Pakistani Secret Service, the, the ISI, and they went forth and conquered Afghanistan, just like that. It's a truly amazing story. And the Mahdi army, these this guys were a bigger deal three, did three years ago, and, but they remain the king makers of, of Shia politics in Iraq today, a force that needs to be reckoned with. And even though Muqtada al sadr was on the we must capture this guy list of the US military, he managed not to get captured there. The Hezbollah. The Hezbollah are now the most powerful political organization in Lebanon. And they held off the most powerful you know, air force in the Middle East the, the summer before last. And for two summers before last. And for a full month. Regularly shelling more than Israel, no matter what the Israelis do. And, oh, and, they, and, and they basically re 
invent of the modern suicide attack in the 1980s. The same tactic which US forces in Afghanistan and Iraq have so much trouble with today. Okay. How to think about this? Right. Now let's think about this professional constraint. Let's think about other economics. Right. So what does that mean? Get inside the mind of the, the, the thought process of the decision maker and try to figure out what their problems are in running an organization. So this is like managerial economics for terrorists. <laughs> well, what's funny? Uh, and so, so let's take this seriously. You're a member of an organization, and you've decided that what you want to do is destroy a target. Maybe it's the Humvee, maybe it's the school bus, maybe it's civilians, maybe it's it doesn't matter. What's important about this target is that this target typically comes, you know, is populated by people from the first world, from the really wealthy part of the world, probably the, right? We're talking the GDP per capita above $25,000 a year. And these folks, the perpetrators, generally come from the poorer part of the world. This is Palestinians against Israelis, or Afghans against American troops, or or even Iraqis against American military or, um, or US supported military in Iraq. So what's and the reason I stress this asymmetry in resources is because it's critical to both the fact that they're attacking the way they're attacking and to the way that they, they, they defend. Let me start with the second thing though. So in, to calculate this operation successfully, what do you need? You need a small conspiracy. Somebody's got a little bit of munitions. Somebody has to identify the suicide attacker. Don't worry about the motivations of the suicide attacker. I think I hope I've convinced you that those folks are not that hard to find. But let's think about the motivations of the operators. So number one calls it, and so what do you need? You need someone to get the munitions, somebody to recruit the suicide attacker, someone to identify the target, someone to do some reconnaissance, and then somebody else to raise money and maybe post an announcement on the internet or something like that. And those, those functions happen almost all the time in, in a suicide attack. Okay, so now number one calls number two on the phone. Maybe you're number one. You're calling number two on the phone, and you're saying, okay, I've identified the attacker, and your job is to show up with the munitions. And then please call number three and tell them to take care of the website, or whatever it is. Now number two hangs up the phone, and now he has a decision to make. And this is where the asymmetry in resources comes in. You see, he could go ahead and do his duty, as he agreed to do. Or what else could he do? Sell the information. He can sell the information, right? These folks come from the first world. First of all, they don't hear that. He can sell the information. How much is the US military prepared to pay in a reward that will save the Humvee when it goes on patrol the next morning? Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions? Stop when I get to the right number. <laughs> what if the school bus full of, full of children? Or a group of Iraqi civilians? Or a member of the Iraqi parliament? So we're talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars a minimum. Okay. In the Philippines, the vote rate is $25,000 to $50,000 for information that will protect a government official. Okay. So this guy now has a decision to make. Right? He could trade the information for a witness protection somewhere, or if he's really smart, he can stay where he is, and keep on supplying information. And the amount of money he'll make will exceed his earnings for years. Maybe the earnings of him and all of his family for years. Maybe his earnings for a lifetime. And so what often happens in these organizations is they sell out. And every organization that I can think of, except for the Hezbollah, we have lots, we have lots of examples, multiple examples, including Al Qaeda, of people selling the information for money. Okay. So if you're trying to run this organization, or if you're number one, this is your biggest problem. You have to find operatives that will not sell it. Okay. That's what I think of as a defection constraint. And no defection is common. Ah. So at the beginning, remember those two pie charts? I was asking you what section of religion. Well. And then I was also asking, why are there so few organizations that can do this successfully? Well, here's an answer. Here's a conjecture. There are few so few organizations that can do this so successfully because you know, most of the plots are broken up before anybody gets hurt. 
And if you ask counterterrorism officials or counterinsurgency officials, or the CIA, the FBI, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, they'll tell you that's exactly the case. Most organizations are easily infiltrated and, and leak information like crazy, and so they get shut down real fast. The Ford Dicks bombers, the soccer players in Toronto, that would be the pattern that, that, yeah, that that's the general pattern. There are other organizations that managed to carry out one attack, like the Doctors Club in, in, in London, but after that they're finished. Very few organizations managed to sustain attacks. Those are the organizations in which nobody is selling out. I, I feel for you because you're fanning yourselves and I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> and I, I'll, maybe I'll just speak faster. Skip some slides. Okay. This is, um, I'm going to demonstrate that there's a model for this, and this is a demonstration by PowerPoint. But I'll show you where you can find these models right away. You can model this thing. But let's not do that now. It's, 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 it's hard enough. So, which of the organizations do you think that are the most successful at this kind of activity? Well, if you were studying the list before, you noticed that of the top six, including the Tamil Tigers, five religious radicals. Okay. So now the question is, why is the religious radicals are so good at keeping people from defecting? This is all conjecture at this point. But let's just run the argument through. Well, here's a possible explanation for why religious radicals are so good at keep, keeping people from defecting. So when I say religious radicals, I mean folks like this. And does anybody recognize these folks? They're Amish, yeah. So and remember, remember the Amish? Religious liberty fled Europe, came to America where life was, where, 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 where they could practice any religion they pleased, and they go off and they practice their religion in places like Pennsylvania and Ohio and a little further west of there. They're really quite unusual folks. They dress up in unusual ways. They also, um, and this will, What's interesting about the economics of Amish communities? Anybody know? No electricity. Yeah, they, they have a whole pile of prohibitions. Things you're not allowed to do, like use electricity, or use motor vehicles, or in some cases, groups like this won't allow modern healthcare, so that they won't use antibiotics, or they, uh, or they won't allow operations, they're involved with prescription, things like that. Very strange way to live if you think about it. Very different from the kind of the optimizing individual that's in the models. Right? That's a puzzle. Here's some other puzzle folks. These are ultra-Orthodox Jews. This is where I got started in this research, actually. And these folks also have an unusual dress code. Also have a lot of prohibitions in their lives. And there's a whole long list of things that you're not allowed to do, which involve how you eat, the language you speak, how you how and when and where you shave, and what you do, what you're allowed to do on the Sabbath, and and then I won't even get into the restrictions of, on who and when and how you can have sex. There would be an interesting provocative lecture on that. I'm going to drop that one. Suffice to say, they take on a lot of prohibitions. Now you might say to yourself, oh, wait a moment, what about optimization? Right? The optimizing agent of your models, he walks into the supermarket, she walks into the supermarket, she looks at all the different choices in the basket, and picks the one that makes or what happiest, right? What kind of optimizing idiot walks into the supermarket and says, that, 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 all the things on that shelf, all these activities and all, all those guys, not allowed. That doesn't sound like optimization, limiting your choice set before you even get started out of fun, right? Yet that's exactly what these organizations, what these, what these communities do. The people volunteer to join these communities. So you might ask, and so I'm Jewish, and actually I keep a lot of dietary restrictions. And I actually live at what I do on the Sabbath. And I have strict rules on what happens to a certain organ of, the, of my son on the eighth day. A whole bunch of strange things happen. And I'm telling you, I, I can admit about myself that this doesn't fit so well into the optimizing model. Okay? Radical Islamists and unusual dress codes, right? Prohibitions on what you can do. And let me just take note of another thing, which is common among all these groups. The approach to human capital accumulation goes down right back. Right? So anybody who's taken an econ course knows that every year of education is worth at least 8% more earnings down the line. Right? 
And yet, all of these groups insist on sending the kids to schools where they don't learn the things that where you accumulate human capital, where instead you learn to recite the holy books by Rome. And in general, they limit education in secular studies to things where we know the return is. And when I say no, I mean I've estimated the returns to education for these folks and for these folks. And for these guys, they're zero after 10th grade. And for these folks, they're very low after about, you know, after about you know, six to eight. Sixth or eighth grade. And so there's very strong evidence that you know, people are making investments which are dominated in a human capital accumulation. Now you might say, well, that's fine, that's my preference. And I'm okay with that. I'm just noting that all of these groups, though they have very different theological reasons for doing so, do something which is very strange in similar ways, which is these prohibitions on behavior, prohibited behaviors. And sacrifice of earnings capabilities early in life. There are a whole bunch of other sacrifices, but I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to go into too much detail. There's, a, there's another thing, and here's a really amazing part. We learned this from sociologists and religion. There's another thing that all these groups have in common in their behaviorist communities. Anybody know what it is? Anybody ever spent some time with the Amish? <laughs> the ultra Orthodox Jews? Radical Islam communities? Okay, well, let me, I'll, I'll just give it away because I know you're hot. Can anyone guess? The Excuse me? The clothes. No, the clothes we talked about. And that's a good guess. You know, they don't interact with others. Yeah, well, for one thing, they're isolationist. They prefer not to interact with outsiders. Now, let's see what I was getting at. It's what they do inside the community, which is so fascinating. They're misogynist. <laughs> there is misogyny, but, and that's fun too. We can do another provocative question on that. But actually, <laughs> And misogyny does, does, does not extend to all these groups in all, in all places in the world. But there, there is something which is true everywhere in all these, these communities, which is mutual aid. The amount of sharing and mutual aid that goes on within these communities, the amount of charitable activity within these communities puts the Catholic charities to shame. Right? If you live in one of these communities, on average people are poor, but nobody's hungry, nobody's without clothing, if you're bereaved, if you lose a if you lose a loved one, people will come to console you. It's guaranteed. People you don't know will come to console you because it's one of the functions of the community. If you're without a job, there's somebody to go to who will try to help you. They're as active as you picture the most you know, supportive church, mosque, or synagogue that you're familiar with. These folks are four or five times better at doing that kind of thing. The soup kitchens, the aid to the needy, the aid to people with psychological problems, they're incredibly tight communities. To the extent that they're supportive of other members of the community at about the same order of magnitude as you would be supportive of members of your own nuclear family. All right? So you're more supportive than you probably are of your cousins, or than your cousins are of you. Right? It's really quite remarkable. Now, most people look at that, and there's a pile of evidence of this, I'm not going to go into too much detail. But for instance, if you were at your age, say in one of these communities, and you weren't married yet, that's a bad shot. They'll find you something. See, you're, they're insured in ways that the market doesn't even know how to insure. Right. Now, most people look at that and say, oh, isn't that wonderful? Aren't those fantastic communities? Isn't that just, isn't our humans just the bees and isn't that just great? But economists were special. We look at that and say, how could that possibly be incentive compatible? Right? This is our sickness, it's our curse. Right? And we have to make sure that anything we see can be rationalized at the individual level. Okay? And that's true of conflicts, it's true of everything I talked about tonight. You've got to make sure that it's micro, that there's a micro foundation for everything that's going on. So what's a possible micro foundation? For somebody spending their time studying the religious texts, like these guys do in Israel now, until they're in their 40s before they go to work, or for not giving your children medical care because it's not allowed, or for insisting on a diet which is which is clearly not okay. Why would anyone do that? In fact, if, let me just talk about Jews for a moment. When Jews circumcise on the eighth day, Jews are not circumcised. Christians are. So for my great, 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 great grandparents in the Ukraine, when they circumcise the child on the eighth day, they mark them as Jewish in a way that you can't change. Right? Because medic surgery hadn't arrived yet. 
So it wasn't Southern California, it was Ukraine. And so <laughs> when the Cossacks came around and killed all the Jewish babies, right, you destroyed your option to take that child and leave it with the Christian neighbors and save its life. You destroyed that option. Why would you do such a thing? And yet to this day, if the child isn't circumcised, then there's probably no way my daughter's married. Okay? We just take the circumcision thing very seriously. And so you ask yourself, why would people do all these things? And the answer, the answer is due to your friend of mine, Larry Anthony. Yeah, Anthony said, the incentive compatibility problem is solved by the prohibitions and sacrifices. That is to say, mutual aid. What was the problem of mutual aid? With running orphanages and volunteer work and healthcare and all this thing within a community? Well, the problem is, is the problem of every commune, right? Why do communes fall apart? Because communes don't work. Why do communes work? Well, communes don't work because in a commune, everybody's supposed to give according to their ability and take according to their need. Right? I know you guys have a history of Marxism here in this very building. And so, <laughs> and you probably, so you probably now know by rote why it doesn't work. It doesn't work because people have strong individual incentives to take a point of their ability and give a point of their receiving need. All right? So, hmm, how about it? So imagine that if in your, in your health maintenance organization, people kind of took services according to their ability. They always said they were sick and gave according to their received need. So I'll donate you know, annual fees according to how much money I've got over at the end of the month, but I'll take health services according to how much I think I need. Okay? That's a program of benefit, right? That kind of a cooperative can't possibly survive. And so if you're going to run a cooperative activity, you have to find some way of checking people's natural inclination to take according to their ability and give according to their need, which means that you're going to do two things. Thing number one is you're going to select people very carefully to be members of the community. You're going to try to select out the materialists and select in the community-minded folks. Okay. How do you do that? Well, one way to do it is with upfront sacrifices. See, if I'm willing to send my child to the school where you learn nothing, or we not nothing, where you learn very little, which has market value, then I'm probably the kind of person that's not so focused on market goods in the first place. That sounds like a good member of my community. That's the one who's going to be there when I need someone to watch the children while I take care of the doctor. It's kind of the typical mutual aid activity. The other thing that you'd like to be able to do is you'd like to be able to shift people away from market activities and towards communal activities. So remember, it's women who do most of the communal activity in most communities everywhere. What you'd like to do is find ways of discouraging people from working and consuming and encourage them from staying to stay home and watch the children. Because if the neighbor's wife is watching her children, then she's available to help me out when she likes her children. And so on the margin of working and consuming, the more things that I prohibit when you mark walk into the supermarket, and the less valuable the wages are, the less the incentive to go out of there. Right? I'm going to say that one more time, and I'm going to move on to the next page because we're, we're short on time. But the idea is that the more I prohibit in your consumption, the less it's going to be have to work. Because you basically say, wait a moment. If I can't wear all those sexy clothes, and I can't drive to the beach on Saturday, and I can't eat at all those restaurants, and I can't really speak to anybody in the outside world because I speak this language which is not the language of everybody else around here, and I've shaved in a way that makes me look really strange. My dating possibilities are so undermined that I might as well not bother going to work so I can buy the gas for the car to go to the beach. So I'm not going to drive to the beach, and I'm not going to the restaurant, and I'm not going to buy the clothes anymore. And so I say, OK, I won't work. I'll stay home. When I stay home, I'm more valued to the mutual aid organization. And that's exactly what the community wants. So we had a coy's insight, just to repeat, was that the prohibitions in the South places make sense. It makes sense in an individual budget because if I take on the prohibitions and the sacrifices, the community will allow me to, to, to team this mutual aid pool, which will ensure me against all kinds of bad things that can happen. It's like, it's like gang members tattooing themselves in order to get the services, the protection, and the social activities that the gang provides. 
The tattoo limits your, your opportunities on the outside, but it gives you a whole bunch of, property, of opportunities within the cloud. Okay, I've said that enough times. So let me move on to the next one. Ah. So here's a critical insight that pulls everything together. If you're a religious radical God, religious organization, and you're running a mutual aid pool, then you're going to be better at, at terrorism. Why? Opportunity cost for other activities is lower. But what else do they signal about themselves? Altruism. Yeah, if they signal my altruism, then I'm, a good, then I'm going to be a good aid in the mutual aid activity. If they've selected out the bad aids, the free riders, then I'm also a signal that I'm not the kind of person who's going to sell out the organization for money when the CIA or the Mossad or Iraqi intelligence or Afghan intelligence come waving rewards at me. I've signaled that I'm a committed kind of a guy. And that's a conjecture, and I went a long way to get to it. But here's the evidence. What you find is, if you look at suicide attacks in Israel and Palestine, this is true for the world as well, but this is the clearest thing. That you find that radical religious organizations, like Hamas and Hezbollah, who run mutual aid pools, who are active social service providers through mutual aid, carry out more attacks and are more successful. Successful is the grizzly peer measure of fatalities per attack. More successful in their own terms. Now, how do I know that they're not more successful because their ideology, they have an ideology of hate or something like that? But we saw some evidence about that before, but take a look at this. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which is also a radical, uh, Sunni radical religious organization with exactly the same theology as Hamas, are actually pretty mediocre terrorists. They managed to carry out less attacks, and they managed to incur less fatalities per attack. In fact, statistically, they're not any different than the secular nationalists in the PFLP, the PLO, the other secular nationalist groups. Now, you learn economics, and so we can test here for statistical significance. And what you find is that, yeah, this difference is significant. 5.4 fatalities per attack is against 2.3, difference is 3.1, standard 1.67, divide one by the other, we're above the uh, 1.6. Okay? There's other, other evidence and other corners of this, but this is the kind of evidence that we buy. It's not so much about ideology as it is about the, the form of the organization. So there's more evidence, and we're going to skip suicide attacks, and what does it mean? What means of policy is this? It means that if you're trying to counter a group of folks who espouse an ideology, it may not be necessary at all to, to confront them on an ideological level. In fact, if you ever spend time arguing with people who have different ideologies than you, you probably know that that's not the best use of your time. <laughs> but what this does say is that if you compete with these organizations and their provisions of local public goods, the daycare and soup kitchen and the healthcare and the education and the security. Well, if you do that, then you undermine the organizational base. Because remember, the recruitment was based on the fact that there was a quid pro quo. If I keep the prohibitions and sacrifices, I get a whole pile of services. And in fact, we have got a fair amount of evidence that when these groups find themselves able to provide more services, they get a lot more members. And so, some of these things are obvious, but let me just focus on this one. The better the local public good provision, and the less the ability of these folks to, to do violence successfully. And there's some pretty graphs that go with that. And, and there's some quotes from people that advise the American military. And, ah. So, what's happened now is really interesting. It's fascinating from a development economics point of view. All of a sudden, the Department of Defense has not only discovered that social scientists exist, they're trying to get us to help. And so what do they do? They do it naturally. They go to development economists and they say, how can we develop this economy? And they go to social scientists and say, how can we make this government, the Afghan government, 
behave like the kind of government we like, an honest, um, an honest government that collects taxes and delivers it to the citizens without even a hint of corruption or bribery or anything like that. Like, not that the government of California, more like the government of Maine, in other words. And the development economists come back to them and say, oh, what does it exactly want us to do? And the main point here is this, that this is not development economics that's trying to maximize social welfare through GDP growth. This is development economics that's trying to target likely defectors and sources of intelligence. Defectors are the club model, the one I spent the last half hour on. Or source of intelligence in the hearts and minds model, the one that I started with. If you're trying to undermine the ability of these clubs, these social service providing terrorists or insurgents, and in their service provision, then you have to pay with them directly, which is something that USAID and NECA, the British version of USAID, don't typically like to do. You see, usually a development of Congress will go into a place, like say, in Helmand province in, in southern Afghanistan, and say, well, and security and schooling, the top, or security and dispute adjudication, the Taliban are already doing that. I don't have to do that because it's taken care of. I'll take care of paving roads and building schools and building houses. But this, and that would be social welfare maximized, and I'll provide the services not being provided. This is exactly the opposite. If your problem is the Taliban, then you have to compete with them in dispute adjudication and provide security. And the security, of course, is going to come from. So this is non-standard development economics. Now let me sum up with this. What I tried to do here was a little role. Right? I said, let's take problems that don't look at economics at all. People choosing to be suicide terrorists. People rebelling against governments. People deciding that they want to dress in black and circumcise their children. And not have sex with, with everyone who's offering but only with a very certain struggle with folks. That doesn't look like standard choice-based behavior. It doesn't look like optimization. And yet, there is rationale for it. And, and so the rational choice approach has made a little progress here. We generated test implications, and those test implications, unlike some of the other conjectures out there, were not refuted by the data. Right? And consistent with Galileo's version of what empirical science is about. Right? Test implication tested with data. So this one survives. It also tells us something else, which really is a big deal. It gives us options for dealing with radical religious, with violent radical religious folks that don't involve killing them, right? Which is a member approach number three on the list, uh, what the Defense Department was used to doing during the Cold War, which is involved targeting their enemies. What this says is, no, no, no. What you, you don't want, but what it says is actually what's classic in the counterinsurgency manuals circa 1960s, 1970s. They say, you know, I, they say, a defection is better than a capture. A capture is better than a kill. So there again, defection is better than a capture, a capture is better than a kill. Why is the defection better than the capture? Voluntary. Voluntary information. Why is the capture better than the kill? For one thing, a human being is alive. And for another, there's a potential that a human being will share information. This is a relief. It says that if we take a rational choice approach to what people are doing, we don't have to go with and kill all the people that are attacking us targeting us, or even who think those attacks on, on, are not such a bad thing. All we have to do is change the incentives. That's profound. Yeah. Now, you're going to ask me about policy and about Afghanistan. Let's just go to that. I want to summarize first. Why are there so few terrorist organizations? The faction history. It's hard to keep an organization together when hundreds of thousands of dollars are offered to the faction. Why are religious radicals so effective in that? They figured out how to solve the defection constraint 
when they were doing what they usually do, which is denying mutual aid activities. And I, I can't close without knowing that 99% of what medical and religious organizations do is benign and wonderful. And you should, and we should be embracing it. It's the 1% that bothers us because when they get into violence, they're very, very good. Why suicide attacks? I skipped this part. What you can do about it, you can try to provide services and you can try to encourage competent governments, which is a real challenge, but, but we're doing some research on how to do that. Rational choice matters, the point I just made. That's good news because the alternatives are all really nasty. And, well, we need research evaluation. Okay, with that, I'll close. Oh, wait a second. If you're interested in more, actually, with that, I'll close and take questions. Yes? Uh, there are two things that, uh, two factors within the uh, cause that you're attributing to effectiveness of the terrorist organization. There's the social service provision, but there's also, and you talked about it, the affection, intimacy, close group ties. The two aren't necessarily tied together, although one makes the other. Right, just so yeah. is it possible that the social services won't have the effect you're hoping for because it's actually the attraction and the closeness that's the operative yeah, That's a hard projection. What we know is that there are lots of organizations that are pretty awful social service providers, but where people really like each other. Right? You could be a member of the Democratic Party. You could. Yeah. If you look at the... You don't know. That um, if you look at, at churches in different denominations, or at synagogues in different denominations, there's, there, you, you typically see a, you see a spectrum from very tight communities where it's the, 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 the sacrifice and the provisions are really strong, and Amish, and Mennonites, Hutterites, and then as you kind of move to, and then at the other end are kind of like Presbyterians. Right? Where you can go, you can not go, you can attend, you can not attend. We're all still good friends across this whole spectrum. Right? In the middle, I can fill it in for you because the Church of Christ, the Church of Christ, you can Catholics, da da da. But everybody likes each other in the whole spectrum. But what you find is that places where the prohibitions and sacrifices are strong are the same ones where the mutual aid is extremely active. Did I answer the question? Yes. What is in these organizations' interest to go terrorize and kill hard targets? I, I still don't get what's in it for them to do that. Oh, man, that's the question that I've like, avoided answering through like a whole book. <laughs> <laughs> if there are a couple of paragraphs on this. But, you know, so my colleagues in political science say, oh, probably it's so simple, why don't you just say it? Which is that these are political organizations that aspire to hold power. And when the stakes are high, they organize, they organize themselves in order to gain power, and they want to do violence. When power is not on the table, then they don't organize, organize themselves to grab power. And that's the, that's the case for most radical religious organizations. There are lots of radical religious organizations that organize themselves to grab power, but don't do it by violent means. That's usually when violent means won't work very well for them, or when they don't have to when there's a free and open electoral system which allows them to compete. So, now, that's not, not, none of what I just said are refutable implications. So there are people in comparative political science who kind of try to study these things and think, think that what I just said is true. But it's, and, you know, I'm an economist working on these things and trying to stay on the political science side of it. Very good. Okay, yes.
the social programs that such terrorist groups have, how can you do that when the people you're trying to win over can do more, do more with less? And you try to get that aid from people that they already have. So let, me, let me answer that question. Tell me if I have a question for you. The question is, what about traditional societies where it's the norm? We don't have to be a, a radical, a religious radical, in order to have a tight-knit community where people provide services for each other. Is that a problem or is that not a problem? So, so let, let me answer that in two steps. Step number one is, the things that the religious radicals are doing are actually atypical for the world we live in, 20th central, century Western democracies, but very typical of the world that our great great grandparents came from, which is community-based places where nobody left their community very much, and people were probably living anyway, and they were they, 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 the defection possibilities from the mutual aid society were small. And so it wasn't sent compatible to run very extensive mutual aid organizations. And there are lots of places in the world where that survives. Traditional communities are way tighter than what we call kind of marketized communities. And the reason for that, something that I have to do, is that the market, when it, when it, when it marketizes things, when we buy childcare in the market, rather than trade childcare with our, with our relatives and neighbors, then we lose relationships. There are external, positive externalities that are lost. And so traditional societies rightfully think of the market as a threat. And one of the banners that, that the traditionalists weigh is that this marketization has made the kind of, as a negative side effect. That's kind of step number one in the answer. Step number two in the answer is in places in which that kind of activity is appropriate to find. Policy have a problem with that. But we should recognize that tight mutual aid organizations, if they come from religious organizations, if they come from political organizations, or if they come from just traditional society, pose a danger in an insurgency um, context, which we're not used to. Because these communities are tight enough that they won't sell with their neighbors for money unless they have a really good reason. Right? And since government hasn't arrived yet to provide these services and to marketize this thing and to kind of push the traditional way of providing these services out, and they may have very good incentives. And, and in a place like Afghanistan, I spent two weeks in Afghanistan this summer. In a place like Afghanistan, where traditional society is what provides most of your services and most of your insurance, not the government. There are places in Afghanistan that haven't seen the government in, in 40 years, right? It, it would be very strange for them not to fall back on the community, uh, on those communal organizations. Because traditional communal organizations are talking about. So in essence, you actually have to sell your idea of services more to their community than to the people because the people take their direction from the chief, from their leaders, and that is what these terrorist organizations are taking advantage of. Because we just said here, their grab is power, not necessarily you know, they want power. If power is on the table, they're willing to do what it takes to get the power. And if they have the people already in their control, all they need is the power. Yes. And if you take them, you put power on the table and you're willing to offer them what they want. I mean, of course, now they're doing what it takes to get the power. So wouldn't it be the so-called uh, leaders of these groups or community leaders that you would target, not necessarily the people, because people would follow what their leaders say? Yeah, that's a very sophisticated comment. Yes, you're right. Yes. In places where the information lies with the leader, the person lies well, or where control over individuals goes to the tribal elders anyway, then yes, the people you have to win over the tribal elders. Now, and sometimes the Taliban work that way, and the people of the Taliban, because I have to say exactly what it's not. Sometimes the Taliban work that way, sometimes the tribe Taliban try to undermine the tribal elders, and they do it successfully. That's actually what happened in the West Bank, Gaza. The new organizations came in and discredited the elders, who, in their view, had been collaborating with the Israelis, with the Yankees, with the Egyptians. And that, that gives you a double crisis, a generational crisis, on top of this other kind of westernization crisis. Let me take a question from the side, just for the person. Yeah. yeah, please. Well, I really like your idea of defection constraint. It makes sense in this with the Orthodox, the Haredi, and the Amish, although they don't really have terrorist organizations. 
The Amish? No. No. The Mormons no, are Orthodox either, for that matter. But, uh, well, well, we can talk. Yeah. But anyway, what I think what you're leaving out, which is surprising for an economist, is that insurgencies generally succeed when we have outside financial support, among other support. And we have Hamas and Hezbollah and the Taliban succeeding in part because they're getting money from Saudi Arabia and Iran and Pakistan, mainly Saudi Arabia. And I, I, I think perhaps you're overestimating the ability of these groups to provide social services on their own resources. And what allowed Hamas to take over Gaza was not their mutual aid, but rather influx of Saudi money, which allowed them to basically buy their way in. So you, you have to be careful. But, you know, you're right about Hamas and Hezbollah. They have a lot of money coming from the other side, especially Hezbollah. Hezbollah is not trading from the other side. Anyway. In the case of the Taliban, the in Pakistani intelligence, what I'm saying is not controversial. Yeah. The Pakistani intelligence tried to buy allies in Afghanistan. And they tried lots of folks before it got to the Taliban. Right? They basically tried to buy warlords, which is not so different than what we're doing. But they tried to buy warlords, trade warlords, supply warlords, and none of those warlords could deliver the goods. They couldn't control the territory. The same folks who had thrown the Soviets out of Afghanistan could not control territory. When they hit on the Taliban, the Taliban managed to do it. Okay? That's what's special about the Taliban. Money from the Pakistanis and from drugs. I mean, they have the drug right, money too. Lots of organizations with outside funding fail as insurgents and terrorists. But do any insurgent groups succeed without outside funding? Well, you might think that the, the Sadr, they moved to Al-Sadr as debatable. They were controlled by Iran. They were funded no, by Iran. No, 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 no. Well, there we have to discuss that. We can discuss that one. We can discuss that one later. But that doesn't, I wouldn't say that's the kitchen. And there are lots of other organizations there that are clearly funded by the Iranians. That are not that didn't succeed like they did. Saad though did have a system of social service provision set up by his father and on the side. Okay, but the Islamic Jihad, the Fatah, also have foreign funding. In fact, that's what keeps the Islamic Jihad ticking now, even though they're such they're, they're really kind of the, the keystone cops of terrorists. <laughs> and, and so, and yet they haven't succeeded nearly as much. Right. So cutting off the foreign funding, first of all, it would be, you know, first of all, it's very, very difficult to do. And secondly, doing it doesn't guarantee success. In my opinion, we can talk about this a little more. Yes, in the middle there? Yeah. You spoke a lot about uh, these different organizations that are providing public good and services. Um, as you did describe the groups, yet in the very beginning of the lecture, you mentioned that most of the failed terrorist Yeah, so the answer seems to be that it's about religion, but not about the part of religion they thought. It's not about theology. It is about communities. Right? I think that's how you write this down. Radical religious communities are very tight communities. Yeah, most of the fairly radical religious groups have had any sort of contact with most of the people within them. Everything. And yet, you, you speak to the operatives, and they talk to you about the same compatibility. But I, I know this because when I did my first research project on this, which was actually about, about ultra-Orthodox Jews, and why they were spending so much time in Yeshiva, I went and I talked to the operatives. And the first thing they always say to you is, this is our mission that was given to us by the Almighty. And then you say, well, hold on a second, how come it was 30, they left when they were 30, 15 years ago, and now they're leaving when they're 40. But did the Almighty, like, you know, change your mind? You are the best at that way. And they'd say, well, actually, it's like this. The subsidy changed, and so the community structure changed, da -da 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 -da, and all of a sudden you're talking about center credibility. And so the, in the first discussion, they'll always tell you about the Almighty. But then if you dig a little deeper, they drop that one pretty quickly. It's, it's my experience. Okay, so that's not a reasonable composition, it's just my experience. Yes, this question. So I can hear you. Uh, I'll share it. So if you cover this early, I apologize. Do you consider, um, in your model here, do you consider, and I'm not going to pronounce it correctly, Sean Klein, in the Irish, um, English, Anglican uh, conflict, will they fall as a terrorist group organization? And if so, does its model 
Uh, it's a great question. So, um, so we actually have an ongoing study interviewing people in West Belfast and other parts of Northern Ireland, trying to figure out to what extent they provide services in, in communities they control. If you ask, there are lots of ex Sinn Féin activists, ex IRA folks, and the nature of the peace in Northern Ireland is that they were bought off. And so they now all have safe government jobs and not a lot to do because the Northern Irish government really doesn't want them. <laughs> they're, not, they're not model bureaucrats. So they have lots of time to go to the years with the mass. And, so and they'll all tell you that when they control the community, they provided services. What were those services? Well, there was kind of rough justice that they provided. What they mean by services is, if the teenagers were vandalized in high school, they took care of the problem. Right? If you would come to them to complain, not to the police. And they were, now, that's consistent with both the hearts and minds model and the club model. Right? So they don't have to be religious radicals, have a special dress code. There is something kind of funny about them, but they have nothing to do with it. So they are kind of a high there, they're somewhere where they continue. Mm -hmm. I would think. There was another, yes. Well, can you guys slide 34 for a second? 34. services. 
This is a global public good, which the Taliban can't compete with, right? Because if the Taliban set up these states, it's something that's easily targeted by our team, right? So, and it, it actually develops the beginnings of governance in these places where they've never seen the government, the government's never done anything good for them. And so, these micro-hydro projects, and the other great thing about it is, it exploits something that the villagers know a lot about already, which is how to create a reservoir of water. So you, you, you create little dams and dikes to create a reservoir during the day. And then at night, you open, you open it up and you generate electricity. So you're using the water as a battery. And that generates electricity for the village. People love this. And they're willing to pay kind of a monthly fee for this service and to employ someone who fixes it. So it has the beginnings of local governance in it. It's, uh, that's one of the projects that's being done with great success. One of the other ones that's being done you know, also, and we think with, with fairly good success, is you know, satellite pictures of fields that allow the common land to be fenced and, and allocated to different folks. And one of the big disputes there is over the use of land and the use of common land. So this goes back to the fencing of the commons and the history of economic thought, right? And now you can do it with, you know, with satellite imagery, GPS, these big maps, and that one also seems to work you know, fairly well, even, and it seems to compete directly with the Taliban in the provision of services which they are otherwise providing, which is just dispute adjudication. So those are two examples. Okay. <coughs> yes, the guy in the Yeah, um, I'm just curious why look at this issue really through the lens of religion when there's another factor that correlates 100% as well, which is poverty, and it is economic, so. And the, the homage being unrelated to terrorism and all that. Is it, are you saying that it's circumstantial? I mean, because every group on that list, and it's a provocative lecture, so I'll say it, they're all Islamic, every one of them. Right. On the list. So. Well, no, no, no. Actually, I know a little bit about the Tunnel Tigers, too, but, but we don't have to give that. Let me, let me tell you something about poverty, okay? Civil wars are less likely in places that have IGDP per capita. Conventional insurgencies are less likely to be of Right. Suicide attacks and terrorism, um, this coefficient and this coefficient are not statistically significant. One's negative, one's positive, it doesn't matter very much. But the attacker is generally a poor person, right? Is that true? They know well, the attacker is generally somebody in the same society as the attacker. Okay. Okay. So I want to be careful about this. And, uh, you know, what you just said is correct. That the attacker typically is poorer than the target in terrorist attacks. So, and let, let, so let me jump in there. So it doesn't look like solving the but the attacker is generally no poorer than his neighbors. Okay? And so it doesn't look like just making people richer or reducing poverty will actually you know, reduce you know, terrorism. It may reduce insurgency, but there's no evidence that it reduces terrorism. Yeah, but I can show you some study for this. The development implication of what you're saying is really interesting because there is that focus on growth and GDP maximization. And you're saying social welfare maximization, which is what religions do, is the ideal outcome. And so, so I felt exactly like I think you do going into this. I said, the economists, we have our hammer. We look for nails, right? <laughs> GDP per capita growth. It works here. It doesn't work here. And if you if you think carefully about what the theory of insurgency and counterinsurgency tell us, it shouldn't work in the hearts and minds model. Unless you're telling because if that's the information you go model, and it shouldn't work in the home model directly. It can work indirectly. But the person has to make the decision. Do I share the information with the government or not? That's common to both these models. Well, on the margin, yeah, how rich they are should matter because that will tell you about how desperate they are for the reward or something like that. But what's much more likely, absolutely, but what's much more likely is that person is deciding, think about the Humphrey and the, and the roadside ball. That person is, is deciding whether they want this community to be ruled by the Afghan government or the, or the Taliban. And so they're making a trade, and this might be a long-term decision. It affects them, their children, their grandchildren, perhaps, for all we know, right? And so, 
That decision has to do with how good a job the Afghan government does providing the services, as opposed to how good a job the Taliban does providing the services. Okay? Now, G growth, GDP per capita growth is something that might be associated with the Afghan government if they can get their act together. And they have all these rich friends, you know, in Europe and the United States, so maybe they eventually will. But in terms of what you can see on the ground, do you kick around Afghanistan? It's not a clear decision. Because the Taliban not only can dispute adjudicate, they can force their decisions, which the Afghan government can't. And so if you know, GDP per capita matters, but the security of your friends and relatives, well, that also matters, including your children. And so until you solve the security problem, GDP per capita might be a secondary issue. That's true. Okay? All right. Just trying to go around the room here. Should we take one more, and then we're kind of at the end of our of our time? I am good. The non-combatants can be released. I'll stand here. <laughs> well, uh, what I was going to suggest is that we can pick this up and carry it on uh, after the lecture. If you'd like to speak one on one with Our Kelly, stool. we're going to have a meeting at the bar stool. Uh, that'll be at the Sonoma Chicken Coop uh, and 31 North Market Street, right off of Santa Clara. So you're welcome to join us there. You got one more question you want to have? Countries like uh, Turkey, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, they're no less radical in, in their religious views than uh, Afghanistan or Palestine. Um, one thing I've noticed is that they have a strong middle class that participates in the market economy. Um, what role do you think uh, a strong middle class in the market economy helps? Um, not just preventing uh, terrorism <coughs> and insurgence, but um, like overall development of that country. So, so this is conjecture, but I think it's consistent with kind of the wisdom of thoughts of people who know these things, even better than I do. A strong market economy is great because it generates tax revenue. Tax revenue is great because it generates strong governments. Right? And so you know, strong governments are great because when it comes to the coercive side and to the benign side of counterinsurgency, and they can do their job. So what's also true of the countries you mentioned, Turkey, Malaysia, and Indonesia, with the those three, is that they have fairly strong governments. I am not you know, waiting in line to be a citizen or to get you know, the levels of human rights that you get from those governments. And yet, and if you compare them to Afghanistan, Iraq, West Bank, Gaza, Egypt, you know, they're way ahead, both in the coercive and the benign side. Yes, but it's, a, it, but it's a slow, I mean, remember that hearts and minds, they, both these models were about targeting the people who you think will provide the information. So generally increasing you know, um, GDP per capita at some fantastic rate, like 10% a year, the chance is that you'll actually induce that individual, the one who you need information from, to change their minds this year about something that you've got maybe a 12, 18 month fuse on, yeah, or low. You have to be a lot more targeted about what you do. Can I take one more because yeah. I thought I was in, I was asking you. And yeah, fair enough. So suppose the Prime Minister or President of the country watches your presentation, he's very impressed. He wants to let's come on to the right side. What are you going to do? In very short, your time, how much time do you need, your resources, and overall success rate. Remove or eradicate uh, terrorism from fighting just small. I, I would take the eradication word off the table. Okay. But the, you know, what you would do. Reduction. You would, Significant amount of reduction. So yeah, I don't have a great answer for you. Oh, that's so why you, I was thinking. For okay. example, I, I want to point you. Fair enough. But, so the answer that I've given when I've asked that question, not by the ministers, but by people out there, and I want to spend these days, is. You should experiment with governance programs. We're spending a lot of money, we're spending billions of dollars on improving governance and providing social services in Iraq and Afghanistan right now. And a whole bunch of other places as well. And not just us, the Europeans are doing the same thing. We don't have a clue which ones work and which don't. There's a theory to guide which ones should and which don't. What I would say to them, what I do say to them is experiment. Run, run experimental trials in which can help you figure out how much 
violence reduction you're getting for every dollar of aid in these different places using a whole bunch of different methods. Micro, micro projects, you know, dispute resolution. There are, there are actually 50 different types of programs in operation now by USAID. Your taxpayer money is doing a whole bunch of different stuff already. And what I would say is evaluate those things on violence reduction and try to figure out which ones. There are more than one uh, scholars like you. Competing. They say, I want to join your team. How will you say that you are the best? Among scholars? Yeah, among who wants to reduce, and they say they have similar profile like you. Oh, so they have similar. You say you are the best. You are the best for my team. So tell me. Are you talking about. Are, are, are we choosing my favorite economists or are we choosing between policies? Between economists. Candidates, different candidates. You are one of them. How will you just differentiate yourself? Are we competing as individuals? How many, this, or, is a job. this is a job. I want to give you a Is this where I take off my shirt? I just want to understand. You're talking about competing theories? Yeah. Yeah. Theories compete on testable implications. Yeah. Right? Back here, or back over here, theories should be competing on the quality of the argument. But in empirical science, we should be competing on test implications, on this stuff. Is it true that these folks are more effective at terrorism than these folks? That's a strong, it's a strong implication of the theory, and that's what that's how theory should be competing. Alright? And so you go and do the hard work, you gather the data, and you test the things, and you run your regressions, and, and you pray for statistical significance one way or the other, so that you can know something or give up. That's 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 how I've been my days. And that's how I think that we should be deciding these things. Is that exactly how we decide these things? I was like, shh. But I think, that, that, I think that's the argument. OK, you can tell me different bits. Thank you. All right? Great. Well, thank you all for coming. of the book available. There are sign-up sheets out, uh, outside. Uh, and I bet you could probably get this signed and it's hot off the press. Uh, I just want to remind you we will have